In this lecture course, I'm going to talk about the musical system that has dominated Western music since the 17th century. And this is the system that has gone global, especially in the 20th century, owing to uh, the development of broadcasting media and recording. And so today, in any corner of the world, you will probably hear a pop song, yeah, a kind of pop song in the tonal style, which will use chords. Yeah, so we can say that the system really kind of spread around the globe. We're not going to claim that this is superior to all the other systems, but uh, it is a fascinating uh, system which developed uh, since uh, the 17th century. So, uh, a few words, first of all, on tonality. A uh, very complex con concept and difficult to kind of give it a definition. So, let's just say simple that tonality is a system of relationship between chords. Yeah? So, there will be one chord that is the main one. We call it the tonic. There will be some subordinate ones. And there are further functions, further relationships between chords. So, that's, that's what we call tonality. But we haven't yet discovered what the chord is. Um, I will s still start with one more concept of a key. Yeah? So when we say that something in C major, yeah, C is the key. The key unlocks a scale. The scale, which you can uh, guess, yeah, comes from scala, yeah, which is a ladder of steps. And uh, if you've ever played this instrument, you will immediately imagine in your mind what a scale sounds like. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, again. But if you want to get a chord out of the scale, you need to miss out one step. Yeah? So not just go step by step, but to miss it out. Like these people do, for example. <laughs> that they have chords, yeah, which are based on these uh, thirds. We call them, yeah, because they're between steps one and three. Um, and so they miss out a step, and th these are all kind of chords. Um, and then when the melody comes in, it's actually more stepwise, yeah, so they don't miss any steps. So that's a very typical arrangement. Uh, now, uh, I'm saying that, yeah, the chord is mainly built out of these thirds, uh, intervals of the third, this is just the basic shape. We're not going to go into further complication. But how did people arrive at the idea of a chord? Because these uh, notes, usually three notes, can sound together, and we think of them as a unity, as one thing, as a unit. How, how did this idea, how was it born? So we can't put a date on it, we can't put a name on it. Uh, it was a very long process, and it uh, involved several things. So it's a mixture of musical practice, yes, yeah, so trial and error processes of musicians. It's uh, also helped by the systematic thinking of music theorists, the mathematics and physics, of strings and pipes that are used in musical instruments, the notation and printing of music, and even some theological and philosophical ideas. Yeah, so uh, lots of things to talk about, but we will just have to be very quick with this, yeah, because we want to get to our triads. So uh, imagine that we are in the Middle Ages and people are singing these complex polyphonic um, chants or songs or arrangements, uh, which have several lines. Yeah? In the process of singing these lines, they come across to what we today would recognize as a chord. But that doesn't mean that they thought about them as chords, yeah? because they were born out of these lines. So I'm going to show you uh, a lovely piece by Josquin um, from the very beginning of the 16th century. And you will see how this uh, music is coming out of melodies. Melody after melody uh, emerges.
describe here some of these things as chords, yeah, but they wouldn't have thought about them in the same way. Because uh, we now introduce these metaphors of horizontal and vertical, which they probably didn't have at the time, yeah, because we now have the score. So we think that we're moving in time horizontally. Yeah, and then the chord is a kind of slice of time. Yeah, it's a vertical slice of time. If we stop the recording at some point, we will hear uh, the chord. Yeah, but you don't necessarily have to be aware of it as you're thinking horizontally. So what we're going to look for then, yeah, for the moment when the, the uh, moment or the period when the chords were born, we're looking for the period when musicians began to talk explicitly about chords, yeah, began to shape their music around successions of chords rather than combinations of melody. And so it happens mainly between 1500 and 1600 and during that century. So it's a long period and uh, various things happen and I will try to explain it very quickly how things come from different uh, sides yeah, to the uh, new conceptualization of music. So one thing that happens during that century is the desire, the new desire for the text to be clear. Yeah, so you were probably hearing the previous piece and you know, if you don't know the text, you cannot actually guess what the text is. You hear individual syllables, it's all jumbled up. Now that's absolutely fine if you're singing for God because obviously God knows what you're talking about anyway, even if it's in Latin. Yeah, but if you actually <laughs> want uh, your parishioners to understand it and sing with you, yeah, especially if when you we switch the Protestantism, yeah, in Lutheranism, we switch from the Latin to the vernacular, you want them to hear the text. So the music has to be, in, the, in a way, become simpler yeah, and more transparent for this text to be heard. And the same thing happens in uh, Italian madrigals because you now have um, singing with accompaniment of instruments and you're very interested in poetry. You want to, for music to represent what uh, the poetry says. Yeah, so in order for that uh, text to be heard, you also make it slightly less complicated. At the same time, uh, there are changes in compositional practices. Yeah, so people um, used to just write one voice, then another voice, then the third voice. They never put them in a score. The score didn't exist. Yeah, they put them completely separate. They held them in, in, in their heads, and they had to make sure that it still sounded very sweet. Yeah, so that was a difficult thing to do. So uh, the more voices you write, the more difficult it becomes. And I remember very much, very well from my own student years, how I had to write these five voice of strict style exercise. And you write one voice, then you write the second voice, make sure that it goes very well with the first one. Then you write the third voice, you have to check how it goes with number one and number two. Then you write the fourth voice, you have to check every single pair. By the time you get to the fifth voice, you basically run out of options. Yeah, because there are very few notes that you can use in that voice uh, that would, would sound good. Yeah, so it becomes more like a chess game. And indeed, this is what um, uh, an Italian composer, uh, Pietro Aron, complains about in 1523. Yeah, so he says that in writing first the top voice of soprano and then the tenor, a place is often lacking for the bass when the tenor is finished. When the bass is finished, many notes of the altar can find no place. Yeah, so he complains about the same difficulty. So he says that's why, uh, yeah, if you write for six and more voices, Mm, modern composers consider all the voice parts together. Yes, so they're now thinking about them as, uh, as a kind of all at once rather than one by one. There was another uh, issue, um, another change in compositional practice also had to do with Lutheran chorales. Uh, and this is a, a German uh, Lutheran thinker and composer, Lucas Osiander, writing a few decades later. And he says, well, the tradition is always to put the melody, the choral melody that would be known yeah, to the people in the tenor. And that means it's in the middle. And uh, again, your, your people, the laity, cannot actually hear it very well, can't figure it out. Yeah, so he says, well, let's put it at the top so that everyone can hear it and follow it and sing it. So that's a new practice. Yeah, so melody now is very important. And then he says, uh, we must keep uh, within the boundaries of the top voice 
chorale melody and the bass. He mentions the bass as if it is already uh, completely understood that the bass is the next thing that you write. Yes, the most important thing. This is very important for understanding of the chord because the bass note will be very, very important, right? So, uh, and he gives you a lovely metaphor. It's like keeping between two ditches in a street. Yeah, so I'm not going to ask a question what was flowing in those ditches, but you can imagine in, in 16th century. Yeah, so, um, you, so he already gives you a spatial me metaphor of how to fit in voices yeah, between these two things and gives you an idea of a kind of vertical dimension. So the third thing that I would introduce is the emergence of scores itself. So let's have a look at this lovely uh, example. It's a printed edition from 1603. It's a song by John Dowland. And you have some very strange things going on. If you look at the right-hand side, yeah, you can see that there's some music upside down and some music to the side. Yeah, and some, some of it is, um, is, is kind of normal. So if you imagine this book being placed on a table and all the singers standing around it, yeah, they can sing, each, each one can sing their part, yeah? So they will sing together. So this is a kind of the previous type of practice. But if you look at the left-hand side, you will see that there is also, and I will make it bigger, yeah, there is also uh, something else under the first line, the, the cantus, yeah, the top voice. It's the lute, uh, which is notated not as notes, but as tablature, yeah? So how to play it, which fingers to put on which strings. So, and you can see that there, it is very carefully aligned with the voice, yeah? So this is where you get the vertical now, yeah? You absolutely get it um, sort of precise. And notation had to change in order to allow that. The you know, earlier notation didn't allow you to do that. So that's, again, a new thing. Uh, and when you hear it, you can hear the, the chords already quite clearly. Sleep wayward thoughts and rest you with my love. Let not my love be with my love diseased. Touch not proud hands, lest you And another thing that I would like to add, uh, I, I love this, this, uh, this idea of not just compositional practice or some kind of philosophical humanistic ideas or religious ideas influencing this process, but also improvisational practice, playing the guitar. Yeah, so if you think uh, of the guitar, the chords are very easy to understand on the guitar because you basically, you know, you tell people what, what to do with their hands and the chord comes out, you can strum it. So there was this uh, uh, strumming technique which was called rasgueado in Spain and it became very popular uh, during the 1500s. And when you strum it up and down, as you do in flamenco, yeah, you really feel that all the notes are together, yeah, that it's one unit. Again, in the lute, uh, well, if, you, if you do it on the lute, it doesn't quite give you the same togetherness. It's, it's the guitar. Uh, and uh, that uh, style spread in, um, at the beginning of the 17th century throughout Europe. Uh, Spanish music, you can see the quote. Yeah, they're again complaining uh, about the guitars uh, which are banishing the lute altogether. Uh, and various guitar techniques or imitation of guitar techniques you, you can find in harpsichord music as well. Yeah, so they go into keyboard music and so on. Uh, the fascinating thing is, is this uh, book, which was published uh, in 1596 uh, by a Catalan doctor and musician, Juan Carlos Amat. And he uh, presents to us this uh, wheel, yeah? And if you look at it closely, this is also in tablature. So it, it shows you uh, 12 chords uh, in, the, in the top part and 12 chords in the bottom part. Yeah, so you actually have 24 chords 
Uh, and uh, you can guess, I'm, I'm going to get ahead of myself, that these are going to be uh, 12 major triads and 12 minor triads. And he says in this book that, look, you have all this, um, the, the word triad didn't exist yet, by the way, yeah, but these chords. And he says, look, you have all these 24 different colors, and like an artist, like a painter, you can use any of them. Yeah, freely. <laughs> he doesn't actually tell you that there are rules to do it. The rules haven't yet developed, tonality haven't yet developed. But he already has this palette for you yeah, to use um, in music. So then, finally, we get to the major triad. Now, to all of you, uh, if you're watching at home or if you're watching kind of this video in the future and if you have no idea what the major triad sounds like, I will tell you that you do. So, yeah, worrying sound. You might think that my computer has restarted. Yeah, but this is the apple ch ch chime, yeah, which is based on the F sharp major triad. So a major triad is a, a very familiar sound to all of us. And uh, it comes from uh, the, the division of the fifth, yeah? So imagine the interval of the fifth. So between note number one and note number five, you have an interval. I don't know whether I can go and actually show it and the camera will pick it up. I hope it does. Yeah, so you have uh, this fifth and you can divide it, you can put the middle note in two ways, like this. This is the major triad, or like that. Yeah, that's the minor triad. So the difference between them is that the major triad has the major third, the bigger interval, the wider interval at the bottom, and the smaller one at the top. And the minor one, the other way around. Yeah, so these are the, the two type of, the types of triad. So uh, people, <laughs> started using triads before they had the word. Um, in 1558, uh, the Italian scholar uh, Giuseppe Zarlino already writes this as a fact, yeah, that in perfect composition, the third and fifth, or the octave dupli duplications, must in fact be present at all times. Yeah, so actually, triads is something that people begin to like. Uh, even without having the word for them. Uh, immediately, theologians uh, yeah, jumped on this concept and decided, well, since there are three uh, notes together and they sound so good, this must be divine sonority. Yeah, so you can see the same Osiando that we've already mentioned. Uh, says, for God has also put, portrayed the Holy Trinity to some extent in the music, and that no more than three voices can be found or contrived that rightly sound together. Yeah, so then they started uh, trying to elaborate on this and saying that the bass note, yeah, well, we sometimes call it the root, the bass note is a representation of God the Father. Yeah, then the fifth, uh, the top note is God the Son, and the, the the third, which animates the whole chord, yeah, gives it kind of, I don't know, melodic, uh, lyrical quality. Uh, this is the spirit, yeah, the uh, Holy Ghost. Uh, and finally, in 1612, we have another uh, German thinker uh, um, and, um, and musician coming up with the word trias, harmonica perfecta, yeah, the perfect harmonic triad. This is when the word um, starts being used, yeah, comes into circulation. Now, they are already aware, yeah, that there is something special the major, about major triad, the talking about as this sort of perfect unit, a perfect trinity. And slightly later, yeah, 1636, uh, there is a mathematical uh, explanation of why it sounds so perfect. Yeah, it, it didn't exist before, but uh, Marin Marcin publishes his work in which he uh, tried to figure out how a string vibrates. Yeah, so how a string vibrates, and it turns out that the string vibrates not only as a whole, yeah, but also with its halves, and then it gives you an octave higher, yeah, so if you take a shorter string, which is only half of the long one, it will give you a sound an octave higher, 
which blends so well, yet it's consonant, so consonant with the original fundamental that we even, uh, you know, call it the same note. Then, you know, if we take the third of a string, it gives us the fifth. Yeah, then you have some repetitions in the, in the harmonic series of those octaves. And finally, we arrive at the third. Um, and so then the four, five, and six give us the major triad. Yeah, so if you get to these vibrations, uh, you actually have the major triad in every single note that you hear. It's hidden in there. Sometimes we can even um, hear it, yeah? But uh, this is a, there are a lot of visualizations that you can find on the web. I quite like this one, which shows you kind of how the wave um, works in this and how you uh, acquire these different harmonics, we call them overtones. So this is the fundamental, and this is the wave, yeah? So harmonic number one. And then you divide it by two, you get the two octave higher. Fifth. And here it is. You've got to try it. And then it goes kind of out of tune for us, yeah? We can't actually hear all those harmonics. But we can continue. <laughs> so all of those, yeah, are not relevant to us right now. What is relevant that 4, 5, 6 gave us this, this perfect major triad. So it was, it was felt that this is something really natural. Yeah, everything else might be cultural, but this is the triad is a natural thing. It is there in the actual physics of the strings in the mathematics of the universe. And uh, of course, the association of symbolic association of the triad with nature um, remained very important yeah, throughout the 18th and 19th century in particular. And I would like to, to play to you my favorite example of this, which is Wagner's Prelude to Das Rheingold, in which he does a quite an extraordinary thing. Yeah, he starts, he wants to build his universe. It's the first opera of the four operas, yeah, the ring cycle, huge monumental piece. Um, and he starts from nothing. It almost sounds like he's, he's trying to do the harmonic series. So, so he will give you a, 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 a very low note, then a fifth, yeah, and then the triad comes out. Uh, and the same chord is held for four minutes and 15 seconds. It's an incredibly long time. Yeah, if you're listening to this in, in the opera house, uh, it is so amazing because the orchestration keeps growing bigger and bigger. Uh, you sort of have tears coming out of your eyes by the end of it because the intensity of this buildup on the same chord is so great. So let's hear just the beginning of it for now.
pleased with himself when he discovered this. Uh, yeah, that he immediately felt uh, the, the desire to mythologize it, yeah, to create this story. I mean, maybe that was true. Uh, yeah, but he says that he was uh, uh, s s stretched out, dead, tired on a hard sofa, and uh, he was dozing. Yeah, and suddenly felt as if it if was sinking in rapidly flowing water. Its rushing soon represented itself to me as the musical sound of the E flat major chord, which continually surged forward in a figured ar arpeggiation, which means, yeah, that all the notes are uh, done one by one. These arpeggios appeared as melodic figurations of increasing motion, yet the pure E flat major triad never changed and seemed through its persistence to impart infinite significance to the element in which I was sinking. Feeling as though the waves were now roaring high above me, I awoke in sudden terror from my half sleep. Uh, so let's hear now the, the climax of it, yes, or the ending of that passage. And uh, when it has suddenly ends and switches to a different chord, at the same time, yeah, you'll have the voices coming in and you will feel a sense of shock because you're so now used to this harmony. Yeah, it's become your only thing. Yeah, and then suddenly it's gone. It's a, it's a great moment. of change, yeah? So now you really feel, yeah, in your, in your body what a major triad is. Uh, but it can sound very different uh, if you put it in a different register. Yeah, there will still be a major triad, still symbolic of something wonderful and divine, as he does at the beginning of Lohengrin, yeah, which is a slightly earlier opera of Wagner. Uh, so here he puts it in very high strings and you can barely hear it. It's kind of shining there. It's a celestial symbol of the purity of Lohengrin, who is a, a knight, a yeah, knight savior who comes to, to do some good things and then is not properly appreciated and goes away. Yeah, so um, this is uh, the moment uh, the Lohengrin prelude starts very high up. So a very different uh, color, yeah, but it's the same chord. So uh, now we're going to talk about the minor triad, and I've chosen this picture because Beethoven is going to be more, uh, very important here, and you can see his kind of surly head there in stormy clouds outside, yeah, symbolizing the minor triad. We're going to come to Beethoven in a moment. Uh, but for now, uh, I would like to invite on the stage uh, uh, a pianist, Alessia Ener, who is going to illustrate some things for me and also play at the end. So please, Alessia, can we have you on stage? <laughs> so, uh, so what about the minor triad? Yeah, the minor triad was always considered together with the major as a kind of lesser one of the two. Well, here is a, a long quote. I will just read you a little bit from it, mm, uh, by, from Andreas Werkmeister, who worked on organ constructions. This is from his book. Um, and uh, so he says that major, yeah, it can be named as the natural mode. You already know why. Um, and the second, yeah, 
thing yeah, can be named as the less natural mode. So it's always uh, less perfect, as he says. Yes, do not establish such a harm, happy harmony as the preceding. Uh, what is wrong with the minor triad? Yeah, so it is not in the harmonic series anywhere near the beginning. So basically, it is so far down the, uh, the, the harmonic series. It's 10, 12, and 15 uh, overtones. Yes, by the time we get to them, we cannot really yeah, perceive them. We can't perceive them as a unity also because they don't come one after another. Uh, they don't actually, if, even the triad that they, they make is not related to the fundamental fundamental tone. Yeah, so basically, it is something that a uh, musician liked yeah, and thought it was useful for them in practice, but theoreticians struggled with yeah, because it was so much lesser than the major triads. So you have this paradox between um, a kind of contrast between musical practice and musical theory. So in order to theorize the minor triad, uh, they tried to do various things. Uh, for example, tried to build it, build it uh, down. Yeah? So if you build it down from the same note uh, in the same way as the major triad, kind of inverting the intervals, you will get the minor triad. But it doesn't actually make any sort of acoustical, mathematical sense. So uh, he says that we, we can name one mode perfect and the other less perfect. Uh, this is why uh, even in the um, 17th and even the 18th century, we have some pieces that end, that are written in the minor key, yeah, but actually end in the major. We sometimes call it the Picardy Third, if you've, if you've heard this name. Uh, certainly in this country, we call it the Picardy Third. Uh, it seems that this term arose as a joke already in the 18th century, yeah, because Picardy was sort of the back of beyond, and only there they still did this. They still thought that the minor wasn't good enough to end on, and you had to end on the major. So at least that's one of the explanations. So I would, uh, I would ask Alessio to play us uh, an ending from the Bach prelude yeah, in C minor. Uh, well, first, first the beginning, yeah, and then the ending, and you will see what happens. So that was the beginning in the minor. Mm -hmm. have the love, lovely major third, and you can explain, oh, you know, it was such a stormy piece, and at the end, a ray of sunshine comes in. Yeah, but that's not the reason why it is there. It is, it is part of the practice of ending on a more stable chord. Yeah, so um, Bach, by the way, insisted in these preludes and fugues, uh, because he wrote 24 and then another 24, so in every key. So for him, he, he was insisting on major and minor being kind of equal, yeah? because you write 12 in the major, 12 in the minor. Uh, and yet at the end, yeah, the, the, he still uses this um, idea that major is more perfect and more stable and more suitable for endings. So uh, now we're going to take a talk about major versus minor colors, yeah, major versus minor tonalities. And I would like to just make sure that we know what we're talking about. We're not necessarily containing, com comparing just one triad with another, yeah, because in the minor tonality, you have both major and minor chords. In the major tonality, you also have both major and minor chords. But uh, the main one, the tonic, yeah, is either major and minor. It, it defines this special color that people started associated, and certainly today they're associated with uh, joy and sadness. Yeah? Joy for the major, sadness for the minor. So it is a very interesting story of how these things sort of came into being. And when um, do people, did people decide that major indeed was joyful and minor was sad? So you can see that in 1713, for example, Johann Mattheson, uh, who was uh, Mattheson, who was um, well famous by nearly killing Handel uh, in the duel. Yeah, so we remember him for that as well. 
Um, but he felt that every single key, whether major and minor, has its own particular color. Yeah, so he didn't actually distinguish be between them as joyful and sad, uh, but uh, said that every single of the 24 has its own particular hue. And for example, he says that C major is suited to rejoicing and other occasions where joy is in full scope. But B major, which is only uh, yeah, one semitone lower, so it's very close even to C major, uh, sort of on the piano keyboard, on the, on the keyboard instrument, is offensive, hard, unpleasant, and also somewhat desperate character. Yeah, so uh, this is something that we cannot quite agree with today. And the reason for that, I think the main reason, is that we have equal temperaments. So all the majors on, on the modern keyboard will sound the same, kind of yeah, mathematically they arranged in the same way. In Matheson's time, um, they were different. Uh, there were different systems of tuning, and some of the keys were just sounding horrible, yeah, because some of the, <laughs> of the intervals were not uh, creating these sweet uh, consonants that we would expect. Some uh, woodwind instruments, for example, couldn't play in particular keys. You know, some string instruments would play better in, in particular keys when they have a lot of open strings, like in D major. Yeah, so they loved playing in, in D major. So yeah, you, have, uh, you don't yet have a system when a clear distinguish, uh, distinguishing line between major and minor uh, emotions, so to speak, is established. Uh, a few years later, another uh, German, Johann Heinehen, says, we have heard famous composers write the saddest and tenderest of music in D, A, and B flat major, while in A, E, and C minor, they write the most powerful and brilliant music. It remains the case, therefore, that every single key, without distinction, is suited to the expression of many opposing emotional states. Yeah, so he says, actually, no, there is no such thing as uh, major joyful and uh, minor sad. But because he says that, and specifically chooses the major key keys, you have to say that you can write the saddest music in them, and the opposite. So you feel from that that there is already a dichotomy established, yeah? and he is basically writing as a contrarian, trying to overturn it. Yeah? So something is already happening at that point. We can certainly hear this uh, in, in Vivaldi. Yeah, Vivaldi actually loved minor keys, um, and uh, I think about 40% of his, his musical works is, is written in the minor. But when he uses it in program music, so when we actually know what things are, to uh, what, what he's talking about in his music, such as in the seasons, yeah, which have a kind of poetic text, a sonnet attached to each of them, um, we uh, we can see how major and minor are used in contrast. So in winter, for example, you will have cold wind, so you'll have the minor key. with freezing and trembling yeah, in, in the minor key. But when we get inside and uh, we can light a fire and it goes to the major. In, in shorter spans of time, you can have a switch from one to another, and he actually tells us what's happening. Yeah, so you have ice, and we feel the, the chill of the wind, which still manages to get inside our houses, which is what's going to happen this winter yeah, as we economize on heating. Uh, and then the warm wind comes in, and again it changes into major. <laughs> Yeah, 
so Vivaldi definitely uh, followed the, the principle of contrast. And when we go to the summer, oppressive heat is in the minor. <laughs> and again, the pleasant cool is in the major. But then something happens during the 18th century, and uh, the minor key kind of goes out of circulation almost completely. And if we talk about Mozart and Haydn, people have counted this up, we only have between 2 and 7% of works written in the minor key. And they are usually very special, and people remember them. How, for example, Haydn's Farewell Symphony yeah, is, is remembered specifically because it's, it is so unusual to have a symphony in the minor key. And I remember very well when I was a teenager and was discovering classical music together with my friends, we were sort of convinced that minor was much better than major, yeah? because like Mozart's Symphony Number no. 40 is surely the best symphony. Yeah, so it, minor keys were kind of valued more highly precisely because they, they are so um, rare. So uh, what we're going to do next is Alessio going, is going to play to us a Mozart um, sonata in C minor, uh, the first movement of it. And um, it is, uh, I, I think, only one of the two sonatas that Mozart wrote in the minor key. Yeah, he wrote about 16 of them, uh, and um, only two of them are in the minor. And the, the one of them, the A minor, is connected to the death of his mother. And about this one, I don't think we know why it's in the minor, but it certainly was an extremely influential and very special work. But the interesting thing that happens before I, I let him play the whole movement um, is how what, what, what is in the minor at the start yeah, becomes major in the middle. So the first theme, you have the minor triad uh, sort of laid out for you. And at some point in the middle, yeah, you'll have it in the major. Yeah, and on the contrary, I think the lyrical theme, yeah, which, which will be in the major to start with, uh, will, will go to the minor, and that's a very sad moment, yeah, because it was in the major, and now it's, it's going to the minor. Okay, so now I will I will let you play and turn pages.
So uh, why was, was that the case? Yeah, why was it miners so rare? And you can see that from what people said around that time when Mozart was composing his music. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example, said, the minor mode is not given by nature, it is discovered only by analogy and inversion. Yeah, so it's kind of artificial. Uh, Kernberger, uh, 10 years later, music in the minor is appropriate for the expression of sad, doubtful sentiments for hesitation and indecision. Uh, another um, thinker, Germain de la Cepede, said that minor keys are marked as impaired consonances which leave the listener dissatisfied and unsettled. And this is a serious disincentive to their use. Yeah, not only do minor keys sound unstable, but they also can destabilize the listener's psyche, yeah, so which can lead to personal and social problems. So in the gallant style, yeah, the, the style, um, the gallant style of the classicism, it's kind of undesirable, and this is why it is rare. Uh, this is what you heard. Sorry, I should have put that on before that. Um, thank you very much for playing it so beautifully. So uh, now, what happens if you have a very passionately sad and tragic aria which is written in the major? For example, uh, like in Gluck's opera Orfea et Euridice from 1762. Yeah, so it is a fam very famous case when you have uh, it. Um, it is actually in C major, and this is what it sounds like. <laughs> because Gluck couldn't write music in the minor. He traditionally uh, would write music associated with the tempest, for example, yeah, with a storm in the minor, or with something supernatural. So he writes a big scene for the Furies, yeah, which, which is in the minor key. But this is, yeah, the noble suffering is portrayed in the major, which means that it was absolutely fine to do that in 1762. But 100 years later, uh, Edward Hanslick, yeah, the famous kind of theorist uh, who wrote um, on, on the history of music, uh, took issue with that. Yeah? So he says, whenever Orpheus sings Ke Faro Eurydice, he moves thousands to tears, including Rousseau. But Boyer, a contemporary of Gluck's, he found obviously him writing somewhere, remarked that one could just as well set words of opposite meaning to the same melody, and perhaps they would be even more faithful to the melody. So he says, we are left quite unconvinced that the composer can be absorbed in this instance, since music possesses specific tones for the expression of passion and grief. Yeah, so something's changed between 1762 yeah, and 1854 that it became impossible to write music uh, of kind of high tragedy and passion in the major. And I think the reason for that was Beethoven. Yeah, and here <laughs> I would like you to, uh, to play the beginning of the famous Pathetique Sonata, which actually was influenced by the Mozart Sonata that we, we've just heard. But it starts in a very striking way.
just arrived at the major key. You are at the beginning from this very striking chord, yes, 17, sorry, 17, seven note chord in very low register. Yeah, if you we can just hit play it. Yeah. It actually creates problems for our inner ear because the notes so positioned so low, so closely, we cannot quite hear them separate. Yeah, it actually challenges our perception to hear it at them as separate. We are um, unsettled by that. We feel the certain roughness, yeah, possibly even ugliness to the sound about this. So um, Beethoven didn't necessarily want to write pretty music or even beautiful music, yeah, he struggled for the sublime, he wanted to discover new car colors. So uh, that is a very good example, yeah, how he kind of makes uh, minor keys his own. Uh, generally, he wrote about 25% yeah, of his pieces in, in the minor. Um, and it doesn't seem that much, but it's a huge jump yeah, from 2 to 7%, where, which we, we find with Mozart. And of course, uh, some of his uh, minor key works are the most, again, remembered, yeah, such as the Tempest Sonata, the uh, Moonlight Sonata, the Upper Sonata, yeah, all the, the ones with titles, the most favorite ones, again, are in the minor. Beethoven also does something else, which has become then extremely influential. He creates these mighty transitions from minor to major. So yeah, when you think of minor as uh, being a kind of repository of dramatic emotions, uh, of all the trials and tribulations, and then as a result of struggle, you overcome them and you reach the triumph, yeah, which you've kind of worked on, it's, it's well earned. Yeah? So at length, he gives you this amazing build up to the blast of the major key. And the most famous example is from his fifth symphony, which I'm actually going to play in a Liszt arrangement for the piano, just so that you can hear even better what happens, because uh, you have the minor color, then you have a moment of hesitations, where it's not clear where the music is going to go. And then he gradually raises every single minor colored uh, degree of the scale, yeah, step of the scale, by a semitone, and turns them into, into minor, one by one, and then yeah, you arrive in this glorious C major. this triumph. Uh, so many composers then imitated that. And um, another use yeah, uh, that you are, will be very familiar with of major and minor triads is uh, at the beginning of Richard Strauss's turn poem, O Eisersprach, Zarathustra. And what you will hear a little bit like the beginning of Wagner's opera, Das Rheingold, yeah, you have very low fifth and octave. And then you have a quick change from the ma major triad to the minor, so actually a dark color. And then it's reversed, yeah, from minor to the major. And then again, you have, you have a big, wonderful, glorious um, kind of cadence, yeah, uh, moving to, to a major key. And of course, this is a still, yeah, from uh, the, um, the film in which this music was used extremely effectively uh, by Stanley Kubrick which is Space Odyssey 2001.
called the sunrise, and I, I love how in that still you can see how big the contrast is yeah, between major and minor. Yeah, the light and dark is really kind of threatening <laughs> at, the moment, at that moment. Uh, well, what, what else did people do? Um, well, can you put major triads uh, and major minor triads together into one chord? What will happen? Will we get something bittersweet, like if we yeah, add a bit of vinegar and a bit of sugar? Uh, well, Scraven did that in one of his uh, late preludes. You can see in the last bar, he has both C sharp and uh, C natural. But actually, the effect is not at all what, what we might expect, because all the chords here are so spicy, so strange, yeah, they all have sort of one of the notes split, that it gives us an air of mystery rather than any particular emotional color. Actually, quite it sounds quite good at the end. Yeah, after everything that came before. Um, so, can you make major any more major by using just major chords? This is a question that Prokofiev asked himself. Uh, it's a little bit of a gimmick, yeah, because of course, um, you know, music can be joyful for all sorts of reasons. But nevertheless, I will ask Alessia to demonstrate what he does in his piece Juliet. Uh, the little girl, yeah, where he uses just a major chord. <laughs> happens in the first uh, symphony. Uh, he also, in the finale, in his first symphony, he decides to do the same thing. So you can test it. Yeah, you can test it yourself. Uh, all the chords are major, and that's quite hard to do. But even harder to do a minor piece with just the minor chords. Uh, he tried to do that as well in the introduction to Alexander Nevsky's um, uh, field of the Dead, yeah, so it's a very lugubrious uh, introduction where he tries to stick just to the minor chord, but it's very difficult to do for the reasons I will discuss in the next lecture. And uh, now for the ending, uh, we are going to hear the composer who was a contemporary of Beethoven, but nevertheless, his attitude to major and minor was quite different. Yeah, he was never trying to kind of achieve this uh, rise yeah, from the minor to major. He used minor and major uh, in alternation, uh, like sh light and shade. They're always present in Schubert's music. Yeah, and he even has some of the pieces which uh, begin yeah, in the major and end in the minor, which is quite a, a rare thing. But basically with these things, and we, we're going to play one of the impromptus, um, I don't know whether you would agree, but you know, if, if you ended it earlier, it could have ended in the minor. Yes, if you continued for a bit longer, it, it could have ended in the minor and so on. Because every of, one of the themes actually has two versions, yeah, it has a minor and major versions, and, and they, you keep sort of alternating. This is a lovely piece. This is going to be a, the finale of our lecture and concert, uh, and I'm again going to turn pages for Alessia.
Alessio, and as, as you could hear, everything ended well. <laughs> and thank you very much for your attention. Marinas, thank you so much for a cracking start to your series. We hope you can all join us for Marina's next lecture in the series on Thursday, the 24th of November, on the dominant seventh chord. And a huge thank you to Alessio for your beautiful performance. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>